Hello, grappling fans. Welcome back. Another edition of the Grappling Bulletin podcast. Myself, Howell, Chase, and Corey. I'll be all tired. It was a big weekend, if you didn't know. The return of Gordon Ryan, uh, who's number one on Friday night against Jacob Couch. Crazy event. Absolutely awesome. Going to dive into all that later. But not the only news from around the world of jiu-jitsu and grappling. Because it was pretty busy. But there was some cool stuff. What do you think of uh, who's number one first, Chase? What a show. You know, I, show. I feel like I always come come away with um, a lot of things learned about both the grapplers, about the event. Of course, we're building it step by step, making adjustments. But I always feel like this is the next best iteration. I'm really happy with all the performances. Uh, it was a fun show to be a part of. And yeah, I mean, there's a lot to talk about. Like you said, there's a lot of stuff to talk about. I, I, I'm a little overwhelmed, but in a, <laughs> in, in a good way. In a, good in, a way. in a very good way. Corey. How are you feeling? Have you recovered from the weekend? Not quite recovered. I think there's still some stuff to uh, to yeah. sift through. Uh, but yeah, like Chase said, it's always uh, nice watching. That one of the things I get most out of, out of watching WNO is uh, coming away with maybe the the trends that are going to start to take over the jujitsu zeitgeist. Yeah, lots to break down, lots to discuss. We'll do that today. We've got a lot to talk about. Uh, you know, obviously, the, the the big news is before we get too deep into things is that the the two protagonists of the ADCC Superfight in September returned to action last weekend, for for both of them for the first time in a very long time. And we're going to analyze what those matches look like, and because uh, I think everybody is super excited, of course, for the ADCC Superfight in September. But there's still a lot to discuss before then. So why don't we jump in with the grappling news roundup? A little breakdown of the major news stories from around the world of jiu-jitsu and grappling. And I'm going to start off with the news about Sofia Casella. Sofia Casella, a last-minute call-up to Who's Number One last weekend. And she sets a record in her Who's Number One debut. The fastest submission in a women's match in WNO history. And the second fastest submission ever on Who's Number One. That's quite the achievement. Yeah, I mean, super impressive, right? Uh, Sophia has been championed by Tom DeBloss, her coach for some time now, been on our radar. She's already uh, was ranked number eight. I think there'll be a rankings update soon, and she may jump up a little bit there. But it was her debut. And, and she even said in her pre-match interview, like, you know, it's a little bit nerve-wracking to go into this stage, and, you know, it's a big test. So for come out and have that kind of a performance, which we can see right here, actually. I think yeah, we have a, cl a clip of it. Um, it's not a very long clip. <laughs> it's not. This is essentially the whole match. You know, yeah. so sometimes we cut highlights. Well, the highlight here is just one long sequence when it's really a thing of beauty. Well, it was 35 seconds, the whole match, from start to finish, from the moment that she, that the referee said go till the moment that she was able to catch this beautiful inside heel hook. And it was a pretty powerful uh, application of one of the most devastating leg locks in jiu-jitsu. What did you make of this when you saw it? Corey. Yeah, it was uh, obviously she she is Sophia is a renowned leg locker and Jesse Crane has not been shy about the fact that she's had uh, leg lock holes in her game thus far. Um, obviously, Sophia may be coming out and, and knowing that coming in. Uh, but Jesse set a high pace as she always does and kind of left herself open. So credit to, to both of them for coming out the way we like to see it. But so it, all Sophia, obviously, in this matchup. So this uh, this submission was eight seconds faster than the previous fastest women's submission ever. And, uh, I mean, I, it's rare to see, you know, submissions so quick. But there's something of a trend in who's number one as to, you know, people scoring quick submissions. Because in total, we've had eight who's number one matches that have ended in less than a minute. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> it is, right? Considering I mean, that there's only eight to nine matches on a card. Yeah. You know, we've only had so many events, so that's pretty wild. That that that's basically one in event that yeah. we all we almost have that kind of submission. There is there is of course the the number one all time fastest submission in WNO history. Nikki Ryan versus Tony Ra Ramos, uh, the heel hook in only twenty three seconds. I still think that record's going to hold for a while, but man, <laughs> Sophia, only you know, <laughs> just over twelve seconds uh, after you know, slower. I don't know. I, I I feel like we're getting closer to breaking that record. It's possible. It's possible. And for those that saw the whole match, uh, they noticed Jesse Crane having a little bit of trouble standing up, and that's because there was definitely some damage done. Oh yeah. We haven't heard from Jesse herself yet, but Sophia said she felt some stuff. Let's go ahead and play this clip here to give you an idea of how how tight that that heel look actually was. 
Super, super fast submission. Was that the game plan coming in? Get in quick on her legs? Or? Yeah, I was like, I'm gonna get in on her legs as quick as I can. <laughs> was there, was there, I, I know there wasn't a, a, a lot out there, but was there anything that kind of surprised you? Were you shocked at how fast you were able to get the submission or anything? No, I was just shocked that she let me pop it like so many times. I was like, oh my, like I had it and I was like putting it on pretty hard and it was popping and I was like, oh my God, like is it, am I not doing it right? Like why isn't she tapping to it? And then I, I finally got it, I don't know. Oh, that was shocking. I was like, wow, she's like really holding out. Super tough. Oof. Doesn't man, sound good. It didn't look good. At the time, I remember thinking, oh man, that looks pretty nasty. And then when Jesse obviously limped off and stuff, it's uh, uh, swift recovery to Jesse Crane, but huge congratulations to Sophia Casella, right? 100%. Yeah. We, we never want to see anybody injured, but that sometimes that's the nature of this game. So, two back soon, hopefully. It's full enough. contact sport. Uh, BJJ Stars. We've talked about this a little, about how there is an event coming up on April 30th. I'm particularly excited for this one. BJJ Stars is Brazil's biggest pro jiu-jitsu event, and they're in the process of putting together a very exciting uh, lineup. They've got an eight-man Gi Grand Prix, but they've also got a series of ADCC Rule Super Fights. So bring up this graphic, if you would, please, Tyler, because this shows you that they're now... They've, they've announced seven of the eight participants of this GP, the last to be announced, the, you know, the, sorry, the latest to be announced was Lucas Hulk Barboza. You can see him at the bottom there. There's still one more to go, but what a lineup. Yeah, great mix there of, of emerging talents and established names. You have, of course, the legendary Leandro Lowe and something of a, a serious veteran at this point is Aki Bahians and Lucas Hulk, right? Both those guys have been black belts for some time now, multiple time world champions. Then we have the young blood and Pedro Machado, Roberto Jimenez, Leo Laura, still relatively young into his, his black belt career, and Mauricio Oliveira, kind of like the perennial dark horse, right? On the, oh, on yeah. the right day, can be anybody in one world at every belt level and then kind of disappears as a black belt. So I'm yeah. already really intrigued to see how someone plays out. Me too. I think looking at that lineup there, you know, there's, uh, there's a good mix, like you say, of the old guard and the new, and that always makes for exciting contest, uh, uh, exciting matches. And of course, Roberto Jimenez for me is the wild card because you never know which Roberto is going to turn up. And uh, he's just always, always exciting to watch. So very excited. But that's not all. Let's take a look at the, the Nogi super fights that they have as well. well. Bring this graphic up, if you would, please, because look at this lineup. So all of these matches will take place under ADCC rules. The biggest of that, of course, is the return of Felipe Pena. He's taken on the Enrique Sacconi, who very recently won the ADCC trials in Brazil. You've also got ADCC trials winners, Gutenberg Pereira and Fabricio Andre, taking on Felipe Andrew and Alex Sodre. Bia Mesquita, ADCC champion, returns to the Nogi Arena. She's taken on Julia Boscher, Lucas Protasio, Marcus Pecho, Thais Loredo, and Mariana Rolst. I hope I said that correctly. But this is a pretty powerful lineup and Corey it is rare to see any pro event let alone a pro event in Brazil using ADCC rules yeah but I think it's a sign of a sign of the times right and a sign of what is to come this year everybody's getting ready for ADCC rules especially uh, many of the names in this lineup so it's it's it makes sense that these guys um, in their preparation for ADCC are looking for some ADCC competition um, I'm especially excited to see Fabricio Andre versus Alex uh, Alex Sodre because we saw such great work from Fabricio at trials, um, and, and I, th I think we all need to see a little bit more of him. And I got to say, it's quite interesting to see the, the sort of the the ex sort of the penetration of ADCC into the Brazilian market. Because obviously, Brazil has produced more ADCC champions than anywhere else and than any other country in the world. But the actual ADCC presence in Brazil has never been that strong, apart from the trials. There's never really been that many opportunities to compete in Brazil in a Nogi tournament with heel hooks, and especially under ADCC rules. So I feel that, that we will see more of that soon, based on the success of the most recent South American trials and how popular they were. There's obviously the market for it. And I think BJJ stars and the promoters and the, the organizers behind that event, they've sensed the same thing by switching their no-gi super fight rules to ADCC. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, the rise of ADCC over the last few years has been exponential, right? It's now at the tip of everyone's tongue. All eyes are focused on September, and I think everyone else is trying to ride the wave, right? Like, might as well hop on and and ride that uh, rising momentum. So I'm very excited to see Felipe Pena back in action, right, after his really uh, thrilling world performance in the Gi. Now he's focusing on MMA, ADCC, and, of course, working in more noty competition along the way. It's going to be a great event, and it's cool to see mixing of rule sets, too. I mean, it's, it's yeah. a little unusual, I would say, to have an IBJJF-based format. I know they're also introducing some other rules with the lapel stuff and 50-50 limitations oh, yeah. and yeah. the gi. Uh, so they're really trying things at BJ Stars, and that's why it really remains the most exciting show in Brazil today. Absolutely, yeah. I'm, I'm excited for it. Um, yeah, I'd love to. I, I can't wait to watch. I can't wait to watch. It's going to be a really, really good event. BJJ Stars 8 goes down on April 30th. Of course, watch it live here on Flow Grappling. Shall we talk about pans? It's around the corner. Let's do it. It is. Because, of course, you know, we had who's number one last weekend. We've got ADCC trials coming up this weekend. But pans is the week after. And it's going to be the biggest IBJJF pan championship in history. More competitors than any other pan championship ever before. And of course, the, the attention is on the black belts, right? We love watching the up-and-comers. We love watching the blue, purple, brown belts, these guys coming through. We've always said the color belts of today are the champions of tomorrow. That's no secret. We love watching the up-and-comers. But nothing beats watching the black belts. These guys are the best of the best. And there's a lot of black belts competing. Some of these divisions are really, really big. I feel like the the IBJJF has... Um, has bounced back from the last couple of years, you know, where it had reduced numbers due to travel restrictions and so on and so on. No, no, things are pretty much back to normal now. And there's one division that stands out as being very, very exciting indeed, right, Chase? Yeah, I think all eyes are on the middleweight division here. We have Tyna Dalper kind of spearheading that operation, but He's not without his challenges. Mika did not sign up this time around. So we, we were we were kind Damn of it. hoping that would be so, somewhere in the mix. But there are plenty of other challengers. Corey, break down maybe some of the, the opponents that will be standing in front of Tynan Dalpra. Yeah, so Tynan, obviously the reigning world champion, is going to be the favorite coming in. But this middleweight division, like you said, is loaded. I, I don't know where to start. I think maybe uh, Roberto Jimenez. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a good choice. That. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, he had a no-gi super fight just last weekend. He signed up for Pans, and he's going to compete in a... Uh, I be in BJJ stars in a couple of uh, in a couple of weeks. Man, he he can do it all, right? Uh, absolutely, yeah. He, I mean, his game is incredibly well rounded, and his style is maybe a little bit intriguing for somebody like uh, like Tynan, who who has such a, a dialed in conservative game. Because Roberto, in his jujitsu especially, is a wild man. I don't remember the last time I saw Roberto compete in the gi in IBJJF rules. I was thinking about that too, and. Uh, I also don't know the answer to that question. He, uh, but what Corey was saying stands oh, out. Hang on. He's got his hand up. Let's what is go, it, Corey? Corey. Yeah, he, go on. He competed down in Brazil beginning of the year. Um, oh, that's right. Right, right, right trials. before trials. Correct. Yeah, the, the Rio back. Summer Open. There you go. Okay, there you so go. He's, he's still always in the mix. But. but he's not the only one in this middleweight division. It, it, it looks to me like there's some really powerful names. Of oh. course, there's Ronaldo Jr. coming back. He's always exciting. But big news Levi Jones Leary is moving up to middleweight for this tournament. And now I was surprised by that. Yeah, I think Levi's uh, kind of trying to find his footing, right? A disappointing performance for him at Worlds. Didn't like how that shaked out. He uh, lost to Hanata Kanuto. Maybe he's thinking uh, a little bit heavier allows him to, to just employ more of his literal strength as well as maybe it's a slower paced game. I mean, I know middleweights are very explosive and dynamic, but the lightweights are so fast, right? I mean, yeah. let's talk about I just said Hanata Kanuto and Mateus Gabriel. So maybe he's hoping for a little bit of an edge there. But uh, Levi's always fun to watch. And him versus Tynan is a pretty crazy matchup uh, because Tynan's you know, best game, not that he has any weaknesses, is definitely, I, I would say, his passing. Mm. And Levi is, is known as the, the guard player in this f scenario. So, And if you're wondering why uh, we're playing this video as we're talking about it, it's because there are so many returning world champions who are going to be at PANS, right? Chase, who, who stands out for you? Well, I believe we're looking at Misa Bastos here. This is from the European Championships. Misa, more or less the most dominant female of uh, 
both weight classes she competes in, right? Rooster weight, yes. light featherweight. Really, really uh, exciting athlete, always hunting for the finish. But then we have Eric Muniz in the mix. Actually, a few of the Muniz brothers are going to be present at Pans. There are uh, so many of them. <laughs> yeah, they just keep uh, multiplying. So there are no shortage of talent throughout the divisions, to be sure. Yeah, Diego Pato is back, a light feather. That's going to be great. And yeah, many others. Well, we'd love to see it. Can't, can't wait. Pans is coming up April 5th through 10th again. Watch that all live here on Flow Grappling. That's uh, that's the big stuff, right? That's the that's the kind of the news roundup. It's time to really get into the main story. The main story of the weekend, of course, is the return of Gordon Ryan and the return of Andre Galvao. Happened many thousands of miles apart from each other, right? <laughs> pretty it's unusual, probably... actually, when you think about exactly what we're talking about here. But it's pretty, pretty. I think that's pretty the safest thing to do, right? Is keep them apart from each other until <laughs> September. But Gordon made his return against Jacob Couch in the main event of Tezos, who's number one, on Friday night in Dallas, Texas. And then, just a couple of hours later, due to the time difference, that Andre Galvao competed in his first grappling match since September of 2019 against the one championship mixed martial arts middleweight champion, Renier de Ridder. And there were two very different matches. Gordon, a 30-minute submission-only match under who's number one rules. Galvao, a 12-minute match in a cage, no less, against their middleweight champion. So let's start off. We'll talk about the return of Gordon to who's number one. Because this was Gordon's first real match. We don't count his exhibition against Philip Rowe. This was his first match in almost exactly one one calendar year. That's right. I believe it was 364 days, so can't get much closer than that. And we have we have a quick highlight here of showing some of the best action. But Gordon definitely uh, entered this match with a purpose, right? We didn't know what it was ahead of time, but he's just gotten that good and that confident that he does come in with a specific game plan. And he looked good. He did. He looked quick. Uh, explored a few different transitions here, worked his wrestling a little bit. But really, I mean, Gordon just never got out of the driver's seat. He controlled the entire match. Corey, what were you thinking throughout this this match here? So one thing that, that stood out to me throughout this match, and despite the size difference, is that you know, kind of an, an adage in jiu-jitsu is that you can't see pressure, right? In this match, you absolutely can. You can see how heavy Gordon is. It's palpable. Um, and I'm sure if you ask Couch, he would tell you the same thing, that just Gordon's his ability to control and to, to dominate from the top is second to none. It was all over his face. I mean, we, we commented on it during the actual the broadcast. Chase and I were there on the play-by-play. -play, and, I mean, it, it just looked... Couch looked like he was just suffering underneath Gordon. And there wasn't that big a weight difference. You know, Couch weighed in at over 200. And uh, and, and Gordon stepped on the scale with full cowboy regalia, full <laughs> outfit, hat, boots, jeans, big-ass belt buckle, you name it, and weighed in about 230. So it wasn't like there was a gigantic weight difference. But that's not the point, is that Gordon, when he gets into the top position, exactly as you can see here, the pressure that he is able to create from those positions is just, I mean, frightening, to be honest. And the word is, because apparently Gordon was aiming to catch the arm from the S-mount, but he was able to generate so much pressure and a, such tight a squeeze with his legs in that position that, in effect, it was almost like a triangle choke. It was cutting off the blood to couch his neck, and that's why couch tapped. Yeah, I mean, he also had been suffering down there for 10 minutes or more, and you know, that starts to drain you a little bit too. So, uh, yeah, really one-sided performance for Gordon Ryan. I think he's uh, and he's feeling good about it, right? You know, yeah. he came out online and was, was chatting away, calling out for some big names. Well, he's the healthiest he's ever looked, yes. right? This is the, Gordon has, has been suffering with his stomach ailments for so long. He has just been a miserable and nauseous the, for years now. And it has 100% affected his performance. Now, he still says that he's only 50% of where he should be and in terms of his athletic potential because, you know, the, the, the condition is, is improving, but it's still nowhere near where he needs to be. But he looked different. He sounded different. He was smiling. He was joking before the match. And then afterwards, well, like you say, he was, he was back to form, right? That's right. That's right. I think we have a, a clip here of uh, maybe what you might call a hit list from Gordon Ryan. It has some names that he's looking to take out. Let's go ahead and run that clip here. Uh, well, I got a list of people. Um, Tim Spriggs has that fake belt, so I got to get a match against Tim Spriggs um, whenever he wants. 
um, or doesn't want, he could just mail the belt to my house and save everybody the trouble. Um, and Flo could just mail me the check and save everybody the trouble. So we could just skip all of this. Uh, Pedro Mourinho, I know, called me out. Um, so it'll be fun to get a, a match against uh, Pedro. Uh, we fought once at ADCC. Um, and then, you know, he's just coming off a big win. He won the uh, black belt, uh, Nogi Worlds uh, black belt absolute. He beat Cyborg in the finals, and then he just came off a big win against, a big win against Craig. So uh, he would be a great guy to compete against. Um, uh, who else? Uh, Gaudio. We were, I was supposed to fight Patrick Gaudio before, the, before COVID happened. And then uh, we had uh, one match was canceled because of COVID, and then, you know, he couldn't get into the country. Um, he, was, he was a match I had a, he was a guy I had a, who I had a really close match with in the 2018 Nogi Worlds. I won by one advantage. It was 4-4, I think, like, two to three advantages. So Patrick Gaudio would like to compete against. Um, and then any of the guys who have beat me at Black Belt, um, Leandro Lowe, if he wants to, uh, wants to compete, that would be great if he wants to, you know, make a little extra money on flow. Um, I know Vinny, uh, my village, actually um, agreed to compete against me, but had to do an MMA fight, so he had to pull out. Um, you know, he's the last guy to beat me, so I think that would be, uh, he beat me in 2018 um, at ACB, so I think that would be a really good match to make. Um, everyone knows Penn is not going to do it, so that's like pretty much off the table unless he actually signs a contract. Wow, there it is. Gordon just firing off those names. He He's back. Rather he's back. Length, lengthy list. And, and yeah. then uh, he went and one-upped himself the next day and made an Instagram post saying he'd fight many of those people back to back to back if they were willing for the challenge, up for the challenge. So, yeah, Gordon is in prime form. Seems to be getting healthier. He's, uh, he mentioned in, in this interview that he has another doctor's visit pending, and that will sort of um, – I don't know. Be, it'll explain what he's able to do this summer. The rest of the right. summer, right? Yeah, it'll yeah. help him make his yeah. plans, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so um, let's talk a little bit about Galvão's performance. Then this was his first match in wow, a very long time. Basically, two and a half years. The last time that he stepped onto the mass to compete was against Felipe Pena in the ADCC Super Fight, September 2019. Feels like a lifetime ago. And we've got a highlight from his grappling match here with uh, Rainier de Ridder, uh, one championship. Let's play this so we can uh, we can talk about it. This is, of course, One X. This was the 10th anniversary event from One Championship, the Asian mixed martial arts mega promotion, and they hosted this. Now, de Ridder is the mixed martial arts middleweight champion, and Galvao signed a contract with One Championship to, to, to potentially return to MMA, and you know, they set up this grappling match and. I think Galvao was hoping that it would, you know, serve as a good sort of test of, of where he's at. You know, it's been so long and since he's competed, and I wouldn't want to just step back into ADCC without getting a couple tune-ups. But what did we make from watching Galvao compete in this match, Corey? What were your impressions? Very interesting to watch Andre pulling guard as often as he did. Um, I, I was not expecting that, basically because the last couple times we've seen him compete, we've seen him do everything he can to wrestle and attain top position. Um, now, a lot of different reasons why he could be why he could be practicing uh, working from his guard, but definitely interesting to see. I, like I said, I can't remember the last time I saw him play his guard. And w watching him move, I mean, Galvao's 39 years old, right? He is still a, a phenomenal athlete. And to be honest, the, his techniques and his timing maybe not quite where he wanted them to be but he can still move so well yeah and, and to Corey's point you know, maybe he wanted to ma make an impression make a show and one way to to make a grappling match exciting is to pull guard and get things on the ground it, that it did look like he wanted to wrestle up at certain points too and that may be something we see um from him in the future i guess it wouldn't really work in the super fight because that would be an automatic penalty at any point in the match but yeah, Gavao looked pretty crispy. I think, as you mentioned, how uh, timing not perfect, but still very fluid and looking very good. Uh, yeah, I mean, settling into the mount. Uh, this was a 12-minute match with no breaks. And, uh, you know, with uh, with just over a minute remaining, was able to get to the mount and then gave it up and was still still on the attack. And he admitted to us, you know, we have the full interview with him on our site. You can listen to it. He admits that he said that he didn't feel any adrenaline. He didn't feel any nerves, but he did get tired in the match. And he said he could have been better prepared for it. Now, there was uh, there were no points. This was a submission-only match. There were no points or judges, so it, went, it was a, officially a draw. But I think the important thing to note that if you had scored this match under any rule set with either submission-only with judges or ADCC rules with points, Galvao 
would have won by a landslide because of his control, his takedowns, his everything. But, um, I mean, he was going up against a legit black belt, right? De Ritter is, is from Holland. He's a, a BJJ black belt as well as a very, very good mixed martial arts fighter and, of course, a champion in one championship. But um, in terms of, like, a, a tune-up match, do we feel that Galvao needs to trying to take a couple more of those because Gordon's been so active and Galvao has literally competed once in two and a half years. Well, I think Gordon is just becoming active, right? And he, he intends to do more. You could say the same. Galvao is more or less in the same scenario in some ways, right? Gordon had a full year off with, with one exhibition. This was kind of an exhibition, but I think there's more on the line for Galvao um, than just... He, want, he wanted to look good in that fight, and I think he knows... Uh, obviously, he's, he's got a lot more to offer, and so I wouldn't be surprised to see him stand in and do some other, other things, get in that competition mode. Uh, of course, he's about as experienced as a person could possibly be. Something that Gordon cites all the time, right. saying that Galvao's got you know ten more years of experience than him at the black belt level or something. So I can't believe that we are now less than six months away from ADCC. That's that's pretty crazy. <laughs> so that that match is coming up. Gordon versus Galvao will happen in September at ADCC. 2022 World Championships, and you'll watch it live here on Flow Grappling. Can't wait. Cannot wait. So uh, who's number one? Hmm. We should we should get into the aftermath from who's number one because it was a wild event. We had eight matches. We had five submissions. That's very high. And Corey, I believe that's actually, uh, I want to say that is slightly above our average finishing rate. Is that correct? Leading into this who's number one, the average finishing rate was... I believe 47%. This uh, this last who's number one had a 62.5% finishing rate, which makes it the most, uh, the, the highest finishing rate of any who's number one we've had so far. Pure carnage out there on the who's number one mats. We love it. There were some amazing submissions. Uh, Chase, I think we've got some highlight of this to play, we right? We do, we do. Let's run that thing, Tyler. Uh, compiled all the subs. Kicked it off in chronological order, which means Luke Griffith is going to start this for us. Oh, man, he, he looked great, right? Who's number one debut, came out here, and another quick submission. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, you know, got double leg, but immediately countered back with a wrestle up. Decided to jump onto the back with a little shuck. Got the body triangle from a standing position on the back, and boom, that's all she wrote. So that was when the momentum really started picking up. Then a clip you guys may remember from about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> Sophia Casella coming into this nasty heel look finish here. Again, uh, really clean sequence. Definitely knew what she wanted to do. Zero hesitation on her part. And, uh, you know, Jesse Crane, tough as she was, honestly extended the sub probably five seconds, right? That's yeah. <laughs> the total time required to get the finish. She may may have given Casella a little harder time than... Um, Necessary, but let's let's hope that she recovers quickly. And then there's just it just keeps going from there. I think we have Heisem up next. That's right. Oh man, this back take. Look at this beautiful sprawl to the back. I love the transition here because you know we knew that Cruz had the wrestling advantage and he used it early. He put Heisem down and, uh, and it was inside the guard. And then they managed to get back to their feet and and. Heisem timed the counter so well. He read the shots, he sprawled, he ran around, got the back and scored a submission and he's been doing great. We'll talk about him in a minute. But this, the very highly anticipated no-gi debut of Nicholas Marigali ended with a submission in the final 60 seconds of this 15-minute match. Yeah, and I, we pointed out in the broadcast, but it's worth reiterating here, that that submission came off of uh, one of his very new skill sets, off of a sprawl and wrestling, right? And I think it's really important to note that he's already using stuff he only learned in the last seven weeks to earn submission victories. And it, then, of course, another look at the Gordon Ryan submission against Jacob Couch. Look, you can see the pressure. Man, you know what it reminds me of, actually? The way that he sat on Couch's chest, the way that he's pulling the head up, the squeeze of the of the, of the the thighs on either side of his uh, of his upper arms, but also uh, the kind of the way that he's pulling his head up and compressing his chest. It all re almost reminds me of that um, kind of catch wrestling choke that Josh Barnett did against Dean Lister years Ooh, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, it's, it's miserable. If you've ever been caught by it, by a guy who's got a weight advantage, it's absolutely kind of like awful. It's similar to like a scarfold finish too you know just crush yeah. their chest chest compression choke. chest compression there you go yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a legit finish people do, people have no idea but um you know we, we, we talked about the submissions and I, I think that it's really important to note here that the submission only rule set is only part of the equation why do we have so many submissions on who's number one well it's i think it's a twofold thing Number one, it's the mentality of the athletes because we're inviting athletes who come to fight for the finish. 
And we always tell the athletes beforehand, we say, listen, we don't want you to take crazy risks. We don't want you to compromise yourself in any way in search of victory. But what we will always prefer is somebody who goes down fighting, somebody who loses in the pursuit, the genuine pursuit of victory, as opposed to somebody who just plays it safe and tries to win without doing effective jujitsu. And all of these guys, they got the memo. What do they do? They came out on the attack. They made very impressive uh, performances. They had these fantastic submissions. And that, that is exactly what makes who's number one so special. That's right. And we have Heisem here, I think, uh, looking for a little more. Wants all the smoke. Let's see what he has to say after this win. I'm, I'm just excited, man. I'm five and one. I don't know if there's a better record, but you know what I want next? I want a title, man. I want a title with me, where I'm, where I'm from, being in the state. I can do the ADCC trials, citizen problems, all this sort of stuff, man. So if I can get a who's number one title fight, because I've sacrificed a lot to be where I am at, man. Thank you guys for flow grappling since day one. You guys believed in me, started from the prelims to who's number one championships. Now I got to fight one of the hottest guys. What's next? I'm ready for whatever, and I need that title. Five and one. That is a very impressive record, I have to say. You know, and he he kicked it off right. He had uh, the sort of the, the debut on who's number one. He's really finding his feet, and it didn't take long for him to kind of fall into a, a rhythm, right? And, and he picked up so many impressive wins. Corey, what what stood out for you about Heisem so far since he's been with us on who's number one? So he, he's really kind of uh, demonstrated and faced all different styles of grapplers and grappling, right? So his first match against Sloan Climber was way different than his second match against Miha Havik. He had a match against Big O. So preparing and prepared for much differently built and much differently styled grapplers, and he just seems to game plan perfectly. I think his his game plan against uh, El Monstro was, was perfect and perfectly executed here. Yeah, I got to say, man, he's, he's, a, he's a very impressive athlete. Uh, his jiu-jitsu is... He, not always perfect because as he said he's kill or be killed and and we don't hold that against him right because he goes out there and you lose in the search of victory and you get caught you get caught but what does he do he puts on a show and that's that's important for us and the ratio is pretty good five and one five and one so, three yeah. submissions well it's the other yeah. thing you know we only have legit grapplers on who's number one so you know but uh of course the 205 pound title holder is Pedro Mourinho and Pedro had that very convincing win against Craig Jones earlier this year and Heisem now campaigning for his chance to go against the champ I'm into it I like that match that'd be fun I'm into it let's see we've got a couple more who's number one events to go this year dates to be announced you never know keep uh keep your attention on flow grappling you might find out let's talk about Dante versus Mika calling it the welterweight war man these guys dante leon we know he's a bruiser the submission sniper mika galvao from manaus put these guys together i knew it would be a good match but i didn't expect it to play out exactly like this let's roll the tape while we're talking about it chase great match right oh so much fun right and dante really really showing off that uh he is among the elite in the grappling world. I mean, some people that, that maybe wrote him off a little early, especially the Brazilian audience, were saying, ah, oh, Mika's going to smoke this guy. And Dante took it to him. In my opinion, this is one of the closest matches we've ever had at WNO. Uh, and I I viewed it as Dante winning, but that's that's fine. I think it's, it's, it's great to have a match where two very different approaches can merit uh, a close result like that. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, I think that you, you mentioned about how close the match was. So we have like a debrief uh, with all our referees and our judges, all the officials uh, after the, 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 the match uh, or after the event. And they all said the same thing. They all said that Dante's wrestling was fantastic, that this armbar, because it was a real armbar attack, was maybe the deciding factor. But they said that in their eyes, it was one of the closest unanimous decisions that they've ever judged. And I think that's a great assessment of this match because Dante looked phenomenal in, in a lot of the time dictating the pace of the match. And, you know, he was scoring big, legit takedowns. Mika wasn't letting Dante take him down. And, of course, under submission-only rules, Dante was working for them and he was throwing Mika down to the mat at times. And that counts for something under who's, run, who's number one criteria. But 
what also counts is when things are so equal, when things are so close, a dangerous submission attack is usually what kind of clinches it. And in this case, I think that was the edge for Mika. But two things that stand out for me about this match. Number one, I feel like 170 is absolutely the weight class for Dante Leon. I think that he should forget any ideas of doing 185 from now on, and he should focus purely on 170. Because the losses I remember from him recently are when he goes up in weight. Hmm. 170 is his weight I mean, class. he made the weight easy too, 167 on the day of weigh-in, so he no way problem. Under, yeah. yeah. And then my other thing is, of course, is that everybody was talking about how this would be a good litmus test for Mika because winning the trials in Brazil qualified him for ADCC in September. Dante made it through to the third place match of ADCC in 2019. Now, a lot of people were going to say, this is almost like a preview. Of course, different rule set, different strategy, but the kind of caliber athlete that Dante is, how Mika perform against somebody like him could potentially give us an idea of what to expect at ADCC. Right, Corey? Yeah, absolutely. And I think we saw maybe something very similar. At least we saw a lot out of Dante's wrestling, and, and we know that that's where he's going to shine at ADCC. But we also know that Mika can can stand and hang in there with a an opponent who is capable of taking fourth place at ADCC and getting through several rounds. Um, one thing that, that just kind of uh, struck me here is I was doing a, a pre-match interview with, with Dante, and he said uh, real estate in this division, in this sport, isn't uh, – isn't owned is rented and you have to pay your dues and both of them certainly did here in saying that like Dante I think made the claim that all this talk about how good Mika is Dante made a statement that despite the fact that he lost by a decision he is here he's still capable of doing of doing big things in this division and, and hanging with the best I the, the gr well put well put I think that's a great point I think that Dante of course he's going to be very disappointed with this result but he can absolutely walk out of this match with his head held high yeah, you know, I said on the broadcast, but it's worth mentioning again, uh, he made Mika look human, right? Mika often appears to be, you know, a superhero out there, just untouchable, five subs and two total or total combined minutes or something like that at ADCC trials, uh, and Dante really brought the war to him. Now, people from his camp have said that he opted not to shut down the takedowns in order to hunt for the guillotines, and that was the approach due to the submission-only nature of the match. Fine, fair enough, but Dante was nowhere near being subbed by any guillotine. So you, you right. have to say that uh, Dante's wrestling was really impressive and cr uh, critical to note that that's going to be very important going to ADCC. 100%, 100%. No, it's not that Mika can't wrestle, but yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, i got to say, though, that armbar attack was a thing of beauty. It was tight. It really was. You know, Dan was Dante being uh, one of the strongest 170-pounders on the planet yeah. definitely helped getting out of that thing because many people... Don't get locked out by me and come back from it. Absolutely not. Well, uh, of course, you can go back and you can watch all the match replays, highlights, interviews, and more from Who's Number One on flowgrappling.com. But uh, very soon, very soon, you're also going to be able to watch something brand new. Because last week we announced, we announced our new project, Who's Next? This is something completely different. You've never seen anything like this on Flow Grappling before. It's basically our own jujitsu reality TV show. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. And it's <laughs> going to be a lot of fun. We have uh, many weeks of competition in the can. These episodes are already getting developed as, as we speak. And there's... A lot of fun to be had, Hal. Who's next? Submission Fighter Challenge. The first episode will uh, premiere on Flow Grappling in early May. And it's going to be a, uh, a series, a show featuring Craig Jones and Tim Spriggs as the team coaches. And what will happen is 16 contestants come onto the show. And the winner, because they'll fight off in a series of no time limit submission only matches, the winner will earn a $10,000 cash prize and a three match contract on who's number one. I think the best thing to do is to play this trailer so you guys can get a little taste of exactly what it is we're talking about. Roll the tape, Tyler. Oh. I'm your host, Hollywood Mike. Welcome to Who's Next. You're all here because you're some of the best and most exciting up and coming grapplers in the world. You're here for a reason. And over the next two weeks, you're going to compete in a 16 man submission only tournament. It's a no time limit tournament, no points. No decisions, none of that. Submission only means eight people are getting tapped today. Nobody uh, leaves until there's a submission. Oh, the top. Ultimately, one of you becomes a Who's Next champion and a three-match contract on Who's Number One. Good luck. 
God bless you, and welcome to Who's Next. What's up, boys? We got a special challenge for you guys here today. Whoever wins this match makes it to the house. I want to get in that house. It felt like it's like Black Friday. Everybody just getting trampled. And Freaking this was my first time shooting a gun. You guys are pretty much neck and neck. Oh, I'm good. <laughs> Is this little shit fucking serious? I got straight animals on my team. Straight killers. Tim, you still going, buddy? We can play more psychological strategies. There's someone over there pulling the strings. He looked like he was gonna like, eat me in my sleep. Get the fucking camera off of me. Who wrote this? I guess he had to play dirty. We're here to do whatever it takes to win. All right, if that doesn't get you excited, nothing will. I've seen it about a hundred times, and I love it, man. Me too, yeah. me too. I cannot wait. So obviously, you got a little uh, sneak peek of, of who's participating, of the 16 contestants. You can actually go to uh, the news page on Flow Grappling. We have a couple of articles there, kind of outlining uh, more about the show, what you can expect, and who's on the show, the 16 participants, the 16 contestants. And we filmed this at the end of 2021. And the episodes will start rolling out in early May and they'll be coming out every week. And it's gonna be very exciting indeed. We're really, 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 really pumped to be able to share this with you. But uh, let's let's get out of here with the last topic, which is gonna be just hitting once again, the fact that ADCC Trials is happening this weekend, in case you forgot. But ADCC Trials, the biggest ADCC Trials in history, going down in Las Vegas. This is the West Coast Trials that are leading into ADCC in September. And a lot has changed in the world of ADCC over the last couple of years. A lot has changed. You know, you've basically, you've, you've, you've seen the a rapid L of evolution in the biggest no-gi event in the world, the premier submission grappling event in the world. And I think the, the best thing to do is to roll this tape because we've got two, obviously, very well-known figures from the sport, Gordon Ryan and John Danaher. We'll hear what it is they have to say about the trials and about ADCC, and then we can kind of chat about it. Yeah, I mean, it's been awesome. I mean, my first trials was 2014 to the 2015 ADCC. And uh, we were like in the middle of like basically some shack in like West Virginia for one of the trials. Like we were in like some like, like terrible like middle school gymnasium, like in the middle of the woods basically in West Virginia. And uh, you know now we have, they had a cap at the trials because they're so big. Um, and it's in Vegas, the fight capital of the world. Um, the East Coast trials were huge, the West Coast trials were even bigger. It's getting to the point now where they're going to have to have trials to get into the trials. I think uh, there's no question that within a few ADCCs from now, you you won't just be able to get to trials. You're going to have to accumulate points over a year of competition, presumably run under ADCC rules, um, where they just have to limit the numbers. Uh, even as it is now, they're getting close to the limit of what athletes can do in two days. And I, I, if it continues to grow in the, the rate that it is, they're, they're going to have to make the trials almost like ADCC itself. There were like two ADCCs per year. I'm thrilled at the progress. When I, when I look at the, the technical level of the trials, which have occurred already this year and the previous year, and it's, it's, the game's come a long way. The game's come a long way. That's a, that's a very succinct, very John Danaher, very precise way of putting it. It has, right? The evolution of Nogi grappling, we've talked about it a lot, has just been so rapid these last couple of years. But what do you make of their assessments of the, 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 the development of trials and such? I mean, they're spot on, right? The fact that the sheer numbers, you can't argue with that. There's they're capping division at 256 athletes. That's craziness. But also from a technical standpoint, uh, we're seeing the most technical and precise athletes at a younger age than ever before, right? Right. We have guys that are 18, 19 years old that are basically veterans of the sport, been competing at a, a high level since they, let's say, are tw we're 12. <laughs> and uh, they're taking that expertise into trials and uh, are basically professional athletes in a real way at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, Proof is, just look at the, 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 the recent athletes who have been qualifying in both the North American trials and in the South American trials. The average age is getting younger and younger. But one thing I want to do is just, just illustrate a little of the growth of trials. 
And comparing the 2022 West Coast trials with the 2019 West Coast trials, those were the last trials on the West Coast the leading into an ADCC event. They took place in, um, in Burbank, California, actually. Uh, I was there, it was at the Muscle Farm HQ. They had 342 total competitors across all divisions. That included the five men's divisions and the two women's divisions. This time, there are over a thousand. So it's a 300% increase in the total number of registered participants. And some of these divisions are monstrous. They've capped it, like you said, 256 maximum number of competitors for the 66, the 77. And um, I think they're fast approaching the, that limit as well for the under 88 kilogram division as well. But even the even the, the higher weight classes, which traditionally have had less number of overall competitors, you've got 95 plus guys in the under 99 kilos. You've got 66 plus guys in the, the over 99 kilos. There's going to be a lot of matches. It's going to be probably one, two, three, four, five, six, about six matches or so to, to win gold, even in the smallest divisions. In the large divisions, it's going to be eight matches to win gold. Mo Jassim, if you ever watch the the Instagram live chats that he does on the ADCC Instagram, the official Instagram page, he said it again and again. He's like, guys, get your gas tank ready. You've got to <laughs> come prepared because this is going to be hard work. And he's not kidding. No, we've been we've been hammering the message home that whoever comes out of this should be considered one of the most dangerous people in the world's bracket because it is a immense challenge to get through two days of that level of competition. And uh, if anything, their cardio will be out of this world. Better be. <laughs> it will be at the end of this. This is a marathon. Corey, uh, obviously, we're all excited for trials. But what, what do you make about just watching the sort of seeing the sort of the overall development of Nogi and specifically ADCC in the last few years? Yeah, I mean, it, just looking back to even just ADCC 2017, I mean, some of these trials have, have matchups that um, I don't want to say overshadow some of those matches, but the 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 level of competition is just getting better and better and more formidable and more formidable because of people um, focusing on if not for their entire career then at least for large chunks of it no gi competition and all that comes with that and even more specifically adcc competition yeah one 100 percent, man i gotta say this is uh this is really this is really exciting for me i gotta say the the the, the development of adcc We've talked about it a lot. We've seen it firsthand. We've been to the events. I've This will be my fourth live ADCC event. My first live ADCC was in 2015 in Brazil. I went to 20, so we went to 2017 in Finland, obviously uh, 2019 in Southern California. And uh, I, I just remember sort of looking back at the pre-2015 uh, events, you know, 2013, 2011. It feels like a different era. 100%. I think ADCC 2013 might've been the first pay-per-view I ever bought. Wow. Is it that or pans that year? But anyways, yeah, that, I mean, it was an empty room, basically. Just <laughs> just the grapplers when they did it in China in 2013. Level was, was pretty good. Some of the names you might remember, Gary Tonin stood out, Kwon Gracie, I remember, uh, had an amazing run. AJ Aga's arm, I think, was in the mix that, that year. But <laughs> uh, the sheer numbers of, of people just as good now are, are so much higher, right? Like, like yeah. it's crazy. Um, these trials could produce probably five to ten people that would be worthy champions but it just that's not how it works so that's not how it works man it's uh yeah things are things are a lot different nowadays and i i liked what dan has said as well about how he feels that there's uh there should almost be some kind of qualification process to even attend the trials because an open tournament with 250 people plus in a division is just madness it's just insanity and we have heard that the adcc plan to run a series of open events all over the world, specifically in North America, including South America as well. And uh, Danaher, in the full interview, which you can watch on the site, suggests that maybe um, the rankings points earned by competing in the ADCC circuit could then allow you to participate in the qualifiers, which would then give you an opportunity to go to Worlds. And that sounds like a very uh, a very scientific way of doing it. Yeah, very logical progression. It would incentivize people learning the rule set, becoming uh, more acquainted with how to actually compete, because as we've mentioned throughout the, the years here, it's much different than any other kind of competition. Plus, you get the reward of maybe earning a better seed. So there you have it. Well, that's pretty much it from uh, today's Grappling Bulletin show. Um, like I said, a lot to lot to break down. A lot happened over the weekend. You can, of course, watch all the matches, replays, interviews, and more 
on flowgram.com. We won't see you next week because we'll be flying back from ADCC trials and we're probably going to have a couple of weeks of no grappling bulletin podcast, but fear not. We'll be back sooner or later and be able to follow along all the jujitsu news. And don't forget joining in in the conversation in the YouTube chat as well. See you guys next time. <laughs> Almost made.